From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. And now here is our host and producer, Hilda Labrada Gore. Hey, Hilda here. Additives in our food are intended to make it taste better or look better or extend its shelf life. But what additives don't do is add any nutritional value. This is episode 442, and our guest today is Vani Hari. Vani is known as the Food Babe. She is the author of a number of books and the upcoming Food Babe Family, as well as an activist for helping uncover ingredients in our food that might be making us sick. Today, she invites us to return to real food as she tells us her story that includes hitting rock bottom health-wise in her 20s. She points out exactly what ingredient speed bumps added to her health decline and which we should avoid today, particularly for our children. She goes over the problematic stuff like food dyes, natural flavorings, and refined sugar that comes under a variety of names on the ingredient list. She talks about the result of the double standard in the food industry, for example, how U.S. products include ingredients that would never be allowed in Europe, or if they did, they'd be coming with a warning label. Finally, Vani inspires with the victories she's had over companies like Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, and Kraft when it comes to including cleaner ingredients in their foods. She also explains why she thinks the 80-20 rule, eating well most of the time and letting 20% go, doesn't work so well anymore. Before we get into the conversation, I want to invite you to join us at the Wise Traditions Conference later this month. It's October 20th to the 22nd in Kansas City, Missouri. Catherine Austin Fitz will be there, along with other top speakers, Alex Zek, Tom Cowan, and of course, Sally fallon Morrell. I can't wait to see you there. Go to wisetraditions.org right now and sign up while there's still time. It's the conference that nourishes in every way. Join us. This is Hilda Lebrana Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Vani. Thank you so much, Hilda. It's so exciting to be here because I've been listening to your podcast for years, and I swear I've learned so much valuable information for my family, for my health, for my friends' health, and I just I can't thank you so much for your mission because you have such a diverse group of people here, and I'm just I feel honored to be included as one of them. So thank you. Oh my gosh, it is our pleasure. We have been following your work for some time, and we just love that you're like kind of knocking down <laughs> the companies or at least calling them out on what they're putting in their food that isn't serving the general public. You have been going strong, and we're really thankful for all you're doing, Vani. Thank you. Honestly. Thank you so, so I wanted to back up and have you tell a little bit about your health story because it was when you realized that a certain food additive was bringing you down that I feel like your crusade began. Yeah, absolutely. So as a child, I was addicted to candy. I ate so much candy as a child. I knew every single kind of candy. And I remember just like having a little secret hideaway in my living room in this little secret a side table that I would like store all my candy and I would organize it. And for most of my life, I'd say I was addicted to sugar and processed foods. Both my parents came from India. And when they came to the United States, they didn't know much about the American food system. I think most of us didn't know much about the American food system as it was starting to become industrialized. And so we all became sort of victim to that new chemical dose that we started getting into our diets. And my parents thought, hey, this food is cheap, it's fast, and it's available. And if we're going to live in America, we're going to eat like Americans. And so I grew up on a fast food diet. And I grew up with all of the things that allowed my mother to make things that like other American families were making, like the Betty Crocker, the Hamburger Helper, the Salisbury steak you put in the microwave, all of those convenience foods, because both my parents were working parents. And allowing that to be part of our staple diet. Even though my mom knew how to cook beautiful, homemade, from scratch, Indian food with the most medicinal spices and so healthy, 
like her ancestors, she allowed me and my brother just to eat the American food that was available. And when I was in my early 20s, I hit rock bottom. And that's when I ended up with endometriosis, appendicitis. It was when I got my appendix taken out that I really had that aha moment. And I was overweight, felt really bad about myself. I was in my early 20s. And all I wanted to do was like go out and hang out with my friends and go out and have fun. And I was in this hospital room recovering from my appendix being taken out. And it was such a awful recovery period. Most of the time it takes three or four days to recover from something like that. And then you're kind of, you take it easy for a couple of weeks, but it just took me a really long time because my body was so inflamed from all the foods that I'd been eating. And at the time they said, oh, you don't need your appendix. It's just not there for any reason. Like you can take it out. It's not anything necessary to have in your body. I mean, why would God put it there? I don't know, but I found out and actually your appendix is there for a reason. It populates your gut with good bacteria. It's there for a reason. And when it becomes inflamed, it's because it's completely getting doused with inflammatory substances, like all of the different inflammatory oils I was eating and all the processed food I was eating, the corn, soy, canola, being grown with GMO seeds and being doused with glyphosate, which is the main ingredient in Roundup that's now been implicated to cause cancer in so many different court cases around the United States. So this was something that was just like a mainstay of my diet. And when I figured this out, that first of all, you do need your appendix, and then that the foods that I was eating was causing it to be inflamed, I started to figure out, well, what was I eating? What were the ingredients in what I was eating? And so I started to look beyond the calories, fat, and sodium and carbohydrate sugar levels of a food label, that nutrition label, and looking beyond that and actually look at the ingredients. And when I found out the ingredients were things that I couldn't pronounce, I had no idea why they were in the food. Like I didn't know if that was like for a nutritional purpose or it wasn't, I wasn't sure. So I said, like, let's find out what this red dye number 40 is, blue number one, blue number two, red number three. Let's find out what all this stuff means and yellow five and yellow six. And I found out that the majority of chemicals like the ones I just mentioned were artificial food dyes made from petroleum, that there are studies that show that not only do they cause inflammation in your body and affect your immune system, but also can cause eczema and asthma, which I had been experiencing most of my life. I was on nine prescription drugs at one point in my life. I got off every single one of them when I switched my diet to real food. And it was that kind of aha moment when I realized how these chemicals were produced and why they were put into the food. They were actually put into the food, not for a nutritional purpose. They were put into the food to make us think and to make us think that processed food looked like real food or to make a fake food seem bright and colorful so we would be attracted to it. It was like a marketing reason, not a nutritional reason. And so I said to myself, you know what? I don't want to be part of that experiment anymore. I want to opt out of those chemicals. Those chemicals don't belong in my body anymore. And I just made the decision cold turkey one day, I'm not going to eat any more artificial dyes, period. And at that point in time, that was probably one of the first chemicals that I removed from my diet, along with trans fats too. But it was around that time that that's when things started to totally shift because all the foods that I'd been eating and been accustomed to, the Chick-fil-A chicken sandwiches had artificial dyes. The McDonald's had artificial dyes. The Doritos that I would snack on had artificial dyes. The drinks that I would have had caramel coloring level four that was made from ammonia, not made from like heat of sugar and like making real caramel with like butter. It was like really bad carcinogenic compounds that have been found by the International Agency for Research on Cancer to cause cancer like in animal studies. So this is the stuff that I gave up. And I realized artificial dye was like in everything. That's what I was going to say. It sounds like you had to avoid everything. Right. And all of a sudden, I realized there's all of these alternative foods available at these health food stores. And I started to teach myself about them and these traditional foods that I had never heard about sprouting grains before or all of these ways to like make your food more bioavailable and easier to digest. And One of the first books that I read was Nourishing Traditions, actually. And it was this return to real food and to things that hadn't been processed that allowed my body to heal itself. And now I was living a life where I never had to diet. I was a normal weight. 
I felt good about myself. My skin was glowing. I had no eczema. I had no asthma. I was off all the prescription drugs. And all I had to do was eat real food. And at the time, I was still living this very unconventional lifestyle where I was working in this corporate environment, traveling on the road, working for these C-level executives that are constantly being catering in food. They're going out to lunch. They're doing all these things. And I'm like taking my cooler in the airport with me to Detroit (laughs) and then finding the alternative restaurant that serves real food of like, they're really concerned about the ingredients and going there and getting like my breakfast, lunch, and dinner and like sticking it in the office fridge and like warming it up. And like back then I was using the quote unquote microwave to warm it up because (laughs) I didn't have any other (laughs) <laughs> any other mechanism. But then I learned about microwaves too, right? Like how horrible <laughs> they are for your food. But it took time to figure all this out and on like how we should be eating our food, how we should prepare our food, what we should be eating. And it was this epiphany that allowed me to start Food Babe. Mm. And it was because I was living in a time where we didn't even have a Whole Foods in Charlotte. There was nothing here. There's no infrastructure. There was none of this information even on the web. I mean, the internet was just ramping up. Social media was just ramping up to the point where people weren't really talking about this on the web yet. And yeah. so I was like looking for this information and I was like, I just need to start a blog and share what I'm doing. And then I found out there is another community out there. And I found all of these like minded people out there. And that's when we started to grow this community who yeah. I now call the Food Babe Army people that not only care about their food and what they're eating, but they care enough to like go change the corporations and petition the corporations and meet me at the headquarters of these corporations and ask for change. And as a result of starting Food Babe and then eventually quitting my day job and doing it full time, now we've been able to get several multi-billion dollar food corporations to change their ingredients for the better. Everyone from Kraft to remove artificial food dyes from mac and cheese, Subway to go remove all artificial ingredients, go antibiotic-free, Chick-fil-A to remove several chemicals from their food and also go antibiotic-free, Starbucks to remove caramel coloring level four that I just mentioned from all of their drinks, including their famous pumpkin spice latte, getting the beer manufacturers to tell us what's actually in their beer because it was the one label that I had in my refrigerator that I didn't know what was in it. And knowing everything that I had known about what had happened to food, and how adulterated food was, I was like, I know the beer manufacturers are using these same chemicals. And they were, they were adding these addictive flavorings to beer to make it more addictive. And for you to remember that taste and that flavor. And I'm like, alcohol is already addictive. And now you're adding in this flavor. People need to know what they're drinking. They need to know that there's differences in the type of beer that you buy. It can be really bad and have caramel coloring level four to make the hops look darker than they should because they're using less hops and they're trying to save money or they are drinking a beer that's fermented correctly with the right ingredients, right? right? And so, so yeah, so this is what I've been doing for the last over 10 years now. Yeah. And it's been such a ride and such a journey. And one of the things that I've really resonated with, with this Wise Traditions community is as much as we are about tradition, we are very much in the non-conventional space there's not a lot of people like us. Mm -hmm. We live in this very modern world where the conveniences of fast processed food is so attractive to people. And it is part of our culture. And this idea to go back to what nature provides is something that I feel like needs to be shouted through the rooftops. And what I appreciate about this community is you've been at the forefront of so many different, I'm sure, attacks on your character, on your mission, because of the way you believe and because of the unconventional nature of standing against some of the practices during the pandemic, all of the things that you guys have done. And so I just want to recognize that because I think going through those struggles is so hard when it's happening. And for me, it happened big time where huge budgets were given to trolls on the internet to take me down, to literally leave no comment left behind. (laughs) When I was starting campaigns to get Starbucks to change over to organic milk and what I called Monsanto milk, I called the regular milk Monsanto milk because it's basically what it is. It's like all of these cows eating GMO grains all day long. And Starbucks is a company that 
prides themselves as being premium. And I'm like, you can serve organic milk. And so we tried this campaign to try to get them to switch. And I remember that angered Monsanto so bad that they started a program that was called like leave no comment left behind. And they hired quote unquote independent looking experts that worked at universities to follow activists like myself around to different talks that we would give to any time we would be written about in a newspaper to go attack that writer or to tell that writer, you need to write a counterpoint story on this. Like she doesn't know what she's talking about. These chemicals are fine. They're totally healthy. There was this one professor that never met a chemical he didn't like, like literally (laughs) defended every single chemical in the food system. And it was laughable at the time. But when I was going through it and every time a huge newspaper would write about one of our campaigns, like getting Subway to remove the chemicals or Starbucks or whatever, or I had a new book coming out. And so they would write a profile piece. These same cast of characters would show up. Wow. And these characters were like people like Fergus Clydesdale. And at the time, the New York Times reporter didn't think to ask these guys about their conflict of interest. I mean, God forbid, right? You think a New York <laughs> Times reporter would do that work, right? Yeah. But they didn't. And this guy, Fergus Clydesdale, was on the board of what company? Sensient Technologies. What do they make? Caramel coloring level four. So he was getting paid a six-figure salary to be on a board of this company. And he was getting quoted in the New York Times as an antagonist to me and saying that I'm like, don't know what I'm talking about. These chemicals are totally fine in our food. Oh my goodness. And it was really hard because I've got these guys with all of these credentials, right? Yeah. These professor, PhD doctors coming after me. And I'm just like this girl from Charlotte, North Carolina, who totally changed around her health, doesn't want anyone else to feel like she felt. Right. And that's why I do this work. And I was just out here telling the truth about what's been put in our food and I'm getting attacked. And it was one of the hardest periods of my life. And I'm so glad I've realized the machine that's out there to keep the status quo. And that's what allowed me to see the truth actually in the pandemic and why I appreciated y'all's perspective so much on sharing like what was actually happening with the way we were handling it and how to like really protect our immune systems and like what we should be actually doing. And it allowed me to see the web behind the scenes about how PR is run through the media. And I actually wrote a whole book about that, Feeding You Lies, which was my second book, because I felt like it was so important. If people know the playbook of how these corporations work and how they continue selling us their chemicals and continue selling us their poisons, then they'll understand like how to decipher the media these days because it's all paid for play, right? Even podcasts you listen to now, some of my favorite podcasts now are paid to play. Like they're getting people to just sell things on the podcast. And it's like, oh, they're a sellout. Jeez. And I I just, it makes me so sad to see. But going through that period really started an awakening for me. Mm -hmm. And this is when I just started Truvani, which is my new organic supplement company. It's not new anymore. It's been five years. And then allowed me to focus in on my family, which has been amazing. I've been raising two kids. Nourishing Traditions for Baby Care was one of the first books I bought. And it's like my Bible to how I've raised my children. (laughs) And it's been the most beautiful gift to me because I keep reading it and I gift it to other moms which reminds me, I need to send it to one of my friends who just gave birth. And I've been breastfeeding my kids for now seven years, (laughs) seven years. And so I breastfed my daughter for three and a half years. And my son's been going now for almost three years. And so I had a little break in there where she stopped breastfeeding all on her own for like a couple months before I gave birth. But that was it. And that was my only break. And I've just been sticking to those traditions as fast as possible. Coming up, Bonnie continues to dive into what to look for and why on the ingredient list of the food we feed our children. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Pluck. Pluck is one of the best ways I know to get your foot in the door when it comes to serving your family organ meats. It's a tasty powder seasoning of five 100% grass-fed, freeze-dried, powdered organs, liver, heart, 
kidney, spleen, and pancreas. It includes organic spices and herbs. You sprinkle it on your food and voila, it tastes exceptionally good on everything and it's nourishing too. Plus, it's versatile. You can enjoy pluck on vegetables, meat, fish, eggs, bone broth, popcorn, yes, popcorn, salad dressing, and so much more. You just add the desired blend as you cook or to your finished product. They've even got a zesty garlic blend that has no nightshades or seeds. And for those that just want the organ meat nutrition without any spices, salt, or herbs, there's Pluck Pure, which is a 100% organ meat blend. You can add it to your smoothies, your coffee, or anything else with flavor. For a limited time, you can get 20% off your Pluck order by heading over to eatpluck.com slash wise. And that link will give you 20% off automatically applied. Again, go to eatpluck.com slash wise and get yours today. An optimal carnivore. They have a new revolutionary product known as Brain Nourish. It combines grass-fed beef brain and lion's mane mushroom in a groundbreaking formula. It's the ultimate whole food, no tropic to build a better brain. And studies have shown that both ingredients are remarkable at improving cognition and brain health in the short and long term. Guaranteed to have your brain firing on all cylinders for focus, improved mood, memory, greater clarity, and enhanced creativity. So go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and check out the Brain Nourish product. And Optimal Carnivore has a whole host of products to check out, including their grass-fed organ complex, their grass-fed liver, their bone and joint restore, and more. So again, go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code WESTIN10 to get 10% off all products. That's amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and the code WESTIN10. This is Hilda Labrada Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. I wanted to write a book about yeah. this and my latest book, Food Babe Family, is coming out in October and it's my kind of manifesto to how I raise my kids mm-hmm. and how I've used this information in a practical way on how to navigate living in this overprocessed world where our kids are constantly being exposed to all of these toxins all the time at schools, at parties, while traveling, everything we're doing. Yeah, and you're getting the word out. You have been at this for so long. And again, we commend you and we're grateful for the ways in which you've brought attention to kind of the chemical additives that we're consuming that we're not even aware of. Like, I know you could just decide, oh, I'm just going to feed my family at home and forget about the rest. But your concern for the general public that's out there is sipping those Starbucks pumpkin smoothies or whatever it is. And everyone's having all these things without realizing how it's affecting their health. So let's drill down now on the terrible 10 ingredients that we should watch out for in our kids' food. Because you probably know, since you've been following the Wise Traditions folks, that principle number one of the Wise Traditions dietary lifestyle is to consume no refined or overly processed foods. Dr. Price knew this like 100 years ago. And here we are now surrounded by even more hugely processed and refined foods. So I want the parents who are clued in right now to have an even greater understanding of what they should be avoiding when they're going down that supermarket aisle. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first things that I have this list of like the terrible 10 in Food Babe Family, and I go through it and I tell you why exactly you should be avoiding it. But one of the first ones is refined sugar. Refined sugar is something that is completely stripped of its all of its minerals and vitamins. It's there for the sole purpose to like make food more addictive, especially processed food. And so it's one of those things that's always, I feel like you can always see it in kids' foods. And even in organic food that you find in some of the health food stores, they're adding a lot of organic cane sugar, or they'll have five different labels that don't say sugar, but are actually sugar, like fruit juice concentrate, tapioca syrup glucose, dextrose. You see all of these things on the label, even raisin juice concentrate. You see all of these things. Yes, there's some are better than others, but these are just a way for manufacturers not to make sugar the number one ingredient on the ingredient label because ingredients are listed by the weight they have in the product, how much they are in the product. So they don't want to make cane sugar number one. So they use a bunch of different other substitutes for sugar. And so they can have like whole grain oats first and then have all the different sugars labeled after that. 
so that people aren't like off put by the product. Mm -hmm. And so this is just another marketing kind of gimmick that people use. When you see tapioca starch in a product, a lot of times that is actually a sugar that's added, but it's not labeled as a sugar per the FDA. And this is a way that food manufacturers add a sugar starch to a product without actually adding sugar grams to the product. And this was something that happened actually in the creation of our Truvani only bar. I was creating this bar where I wanted it to feel like you were eating it with like something you would made in your own kitchen, like the mm -hmm. ingredients that you would have in your own kitchen. And so I have dates and maple syrup as the binder for it. And there's no other refined sugar in it. But the bar manufacturer that we were working with were like, oh, well, you can have less grams of sugar on the label if you use tapioca starch. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like, but it still tastes sweet. And I'm like, wait a minute. It still spikes your blood sugar insulin the same. Like, why would I try to trick people by using this other processed ingredient? then I would be able to use something like maple syrup that comes from the earth actually has vitamins and minerals and some nutritional purpose to it. Yeah. So that's the first thing that I would avoid. Not to mention there's been numerous studies that show an influx of sugar and that spike in blood insulin level affects children's brains. It affects their development, it affects their immune system. So all of those reasons is the reason why I would remove refined sugar. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would remove is MSG and hidden MSG additives. These are things that are like autolyzed yeast extract or natural flavors, which natural flavors can mean thousands of different chemicals behind that one label because the FDA doesn't require the food manufacturers to actually tell you the chemicals they're using in that natural flavor. So this is an ingredient that if you removed natural flavor from your pantry today, you would probably eliminate 90% of the really, really bad stuff out there because you're going to be eliminated already the refined sugar and the other things that are out there. But natural flavor is pretty much added to just about almost everything these days because they want food to taste like real food that can sit on a shelf for like nine and 12 months at a time, even longer sometimes. And they want it to tastes so good that you remember that flavor and you keep coming back to that product. And if you think about why a blueberry is so different every single time you eat it, sometimes they're sweet, sometimes they're sour, yeah. sometimes they're just different. And when I think about when I feed my kids blueberries every day and they're getting a different blueberry every day, so their body and their taste buds are getting like completely trained to know that blueberries are not going to taste the same all the time. Mm -hmm. But say I gave them a blueberry Nutrigain bar every single day, their taste buds would literally get trained to only like that flavor. And uh -huh. they wouldn't be open to exploring different flavors and textures and versions of food. And so that's mm. the problem with processed foods is they're manufactured to taste the same every single time. Whereas real food tastes different every single time. You don't remember that flavor. Like when I make a homemade sandwich from like meat that I cured or meat that I roasted or anything like that, like that's going to taste different every single time because my oven may be hotter one day. It might be different temperature. I might use a little less seasoning, whatever, right? It's going to taste different every time. But if I think about what a McDonald's hamburger tastes like or a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich tastes like, it's wired in my brain. I remember that flavor. I can even smell it on my lips. It's so potent in terms of how they manufacture that addictive quality to that food. And that's what they're using. They're using MSG, which in the case of MSG, they're using that in Chick-fil-A, or they're using MSG-like additives, like in the case of McDonald's mm -hmm. and others in, in these processed foods. And so like eliminating that and allowing your child's taste buds not to be hijacked by the food industry is a huge improvement in their diet. Yeah. And the thing is that label natural flavorings or natural flavors, we see it all the time and it's a, it's kind of a cover up, right? Like we have no idea what it's referring to and it sounds so good. We could have a whole show Hilda on natural flavor, <laughs> what it really means. <laughs> yeah, we really could. We could have a whole show. The other ones that I want to, and I already mentioned artificial dyes, why that's so important. And yeah. I think one of the things that really angers me about artificial dyes, Hilda, is overseas, the same American companies that sell us products here in the United States have decided to remove artificial dyes in citizens overseas because their governments 
regulate artificial food dyes and think that it should contain a warning label. So when you see a product in Europe that has artificial dyes, it has the warning label, may cause adverse effects on activity and attention in children. And here in the United States, we don't get that warning label because our government is asleep at the wheel. They actually have to prove a product and a chemical is safe in order to put it in products in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to Europe, you won't see anything with artificial food dyes because food manufacturers don't want to put that label on there. So Kellogg's and Kraft and Coca-Cola and Pepsi and General Mills and all of these giant food conglomerates have learned to make their products without these petroleum-based dyes all over the globe, but not for their own American citizens. And so this hypocrisy and this unethical behavior that they have just maddens me to the point where I've started so many petitions just based on this mere fact alone. Like, for example, Kellogg's, they committed in 2015 after I started a petition to remove artificial food dyes by 2018. I was like, three years? Come on, you already have the formula. You're already using it overseas. Why is it going to take you three years? Hey, good point. But they didn't do it. Instead, they started to create new cereals like Baby Shark and Unicorn to get the kids who are hip to those kind of concepts today to get addicted to cereal. And they were using new ingredients, which are with also artificial food dyes. And instead of like removing the artificial food dyes, which they said they would, they created new cereals. And they still sell Fruit Loops with artificial food dyes here in America, even though they committed to do it. So not only are they liars, but they're one of the worst companies out there because they're literally targeting children with the worst ingredients, all the ones I've already mentioned, natural flavor, refined sugar, and artificial food dyes, like as all three, in the right? cereal. <laughs> to have that first thing in the morning every single day. It's really worth pausing on that. It's just, <laughs> and it's how most kids do start their day. Like you said, we're part of a really unique community, Vani. Not everyone is aware so they're just doing the best they can. Like you said, they're thinking this is quick and easy and it has a cute cartoon character. And maybe this product has a little less sugar than the one next to it on the shelf. So I think I'm doing my family a favor. So I'm so glad you're raising awareness. And you were talking earlier about the U.S. government. Is it true that the FDA allows for over 10,000 chemical additives in our food even before they're proven safe? Yes. So... There's this kind of idea that the FDA is there with like thousands of people and they're testing these chemicals and they're looking at the data and they're doing all the research and then they decide to see if they're safe or not. That's not actually what happens. The FDA, it's a very slim organization. It doesn't have a lot of people. They don't even have the capability to actually research and look into a lot of these additives that are approved for use in our food. What happens actually is the companies who create the chemical and the companies who want to use the chemical in their food are the ones who submit the data to the FDA to get it rubber stamped. Oh. So it's unfortunate that there's not a lot of oversight on these chemicals. And a lot of these chemicals have been deemed very problematic to human health after the fact. I can think of so many, for example, trans fats. Trans fats was linked to 20,000 heart attacks, 7,000 deaths every single year. And this is something that was allowed in our food system. So the FDA finally had to be sued. And then as trans fats finally were banned. But then what did food manufacturers do? Well, they had to find a substitute. So they found the substitute called monodiglycerides. And it acts just like trans fats in our bodies. So when you see monodiglycerides on all of these products, these bread products and other things that keep food and fat from breaking down, that's doing the same thing in your body. So it's clogging up your arteries just like that. It's got amounts of trans fat in it as well. Then you've got ingredients like red number three. Red number three is one that they banned in cosmetics because it caused cancer in lab animals. But you know what? The maraschino cherry industry who made the little red cherries for all the alcohol products, lobbied the FDA to not get it removed from food. So they allow red number three in food today, but not in cosmetics. 
I always wondered how those cherries were so unnaturally <laughs> red. Yeah. That's crazy. And all these products, actually, I would even say, have a cumulative effect on the body, right? It's not just that there's MSG or MSG-like additives in our food. There's that, and then the refined sugars, and then the artificial dyes. And so it's all adding up to a really toxic situation. And you suffered the issues with your appendix and other things, but daily people have headaches and migraines and anxiety and depression, and they don't know what it's related to. Could it be stemming from some of these food additives and ingredients? Absolutely. Like every single one of these additives are pretty much getting detoxed in the liver, right? And your liver needs to work correctly in order to make all the other functions in your body work correctly. And so knowing how I felt like depressed, overweight, feeling really awful about myself, knowing all the things that were happening to me when I was on this diet and knowing how I felt versus how I feel now, I know that they have a tremendous impact on just about every function of your body. And so for me, going back to real food, eliminating these chemicals is one of the easiest ways to start feeling really well. And I think this is one of the reasons why, and I was watching something lately that talked about this, but it was so interesting why there's such a debate about diets. Like the paleo folks are really gung-ho and the vegan folks are really gung-ho about how they feel and how they feel really great eating their kale or eating their meat. And I think it's because both groups have eliminated most processed foods when they go so hardcore on one side or the other, right? And Such I've been on point. both, right? I've been yeah. on both sides, right? <laughs> At one point, I had to go vegan in order to survive because I just was learning too much about how our industrial food was made and all the meat was raised. And I was just like, okay, when I'm on the road, I'm just going to be vegan, right? It was the safest thing to do, right? But then long term, that doesn't make sense. So for me, what I've realized is out of all the diet debates out there, the one that can't be argued, in my opinion, is to remove processed food. Mm -hmm. And again, that's principle number one of the Wise Traditions Dietary Lifestyle is get rid of that stuff. You're right. And then you're like 90% of the way there. I'm just curious if you know the answer to this question because you're so knowledgeable about Weston A. Price. What were some of the processed foods 100 years ago? That is a great question. Some of them are the same as they are now. It was the refined flour, mm -hmm. the refined sugar, mm -hmm. canned foods that were highly processed. They were in cans. I don't mean like home canning process. I mean right. in little aluminum cans. And then the oils still, even back then, he was seeing the deleterious effects of those oils. Wow. So those four, and they're still around today. Yeah. And even in greater numbers, right? There's been right. a big push about the seed oils these days, and I'm so thankful. But it's just more insidious because everything you pick up, even if you think it says organic or heart healthy or natural on the label, if you look closely, you'll find these seed oils, these canola and sunflower and safflower. And it's just stuff that's really difficult for the body to navigate and it can lead to oxidative stress and all kinds of diseases. Why am I telling you? Because you know. But those are the four that Dr. Price noted in his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Wow. Yeah. So like I was just doing a survey of the organic snack bars at the market and I just couldn't believe you're right. Everything either had sunflower, canola, soy, or corn oil in it. And nothing had like organic coconut oil or didn't mm -hmm. have like grass fed butter, of course. Yeah. And it's so funny. We were traveling recently and they had duck fat French fries on the menu. And I was like, this is going to be amazing. I'm getting these French fries. Yes. And before I knew it, I was like, wait a minute. These are the French fries that they sent to room service by accident. We ordered room service the night before and they sent them by accident. And of course, I grabbed one. And I was like, this is the best French fry I've ever had. And it was because it was duck fat French yes. fries. I mean, they're just absolutely amazing. But anyway, <laughs> so when you make things the traditional way, they ended up being, I think, taste better too. Oh, my gosh, they totally taste better. So I have just a couple questions, like I said, before we wrap up, Bunny, do people ever say to you, oh my gosh, you're going too far. Like every little ingredient can't be that bad for us. What do you say to the skeptic who thinks I'm doing the best I can or 80-20, is 80-20 good enough? 
The way that these chemicals work in your body to keep you addicted to the flavor of processed foods, I'm not sure 80-20 works because the 20% that you are eating, the Domino's, the Doritos, the other stuff out there that's full of these chemicals will just continue to disrupt your taste buds mm. and disrupt your gut too, your gut bacteria. You're going to be constantly exposing yourself to glyphosate that's in majority of processed foods. And so I don't think that you can survive that way. I think you have to make a commitment of what you're willing to eliminate in your diet. And like when someone meets me for the first time or invites me to dinner or wants me to have a meal with them, they worry that I'm super strict about what I'm eating because I talk about this for a living, right? And I'm not super strict about what I'm eating as long as it's homemade, as long as it's made with real ingredients, right? I love a cake made with butter and eggs and really good inkhorn flour yeah. or sprouted whole wheat flour that's glyphosate free. I just found this awesome brand. One Degree makes this big bag of it. And so like, I'm like, oh, that's fantastic for a cake, right? So I think that's great. Like, I want to eat cake. I want to have croissants. I want to have pizza in my life, right? I want to eat all of these things, but like, make it homemade, make it with good ingredients. When you decide to eat out, of course, you're eliminating that control of those ingredients and you do have to look the other way. And I do, but eating out is not a regular part of my diet unless I'm traveling, right? And even when I'm traveling, I'm trying to stay in a place that has a kitchen or access to something like that. But a lot of times it may not happen because that's another love of mine is travel. And so yes. I've really had to try to figure out what snacks can I bring? Like what can I do and what can I educate the hotel on or where I'm staying to make something a more traditional way than what they've made? Or do I tell them in advance, my kids don't eat artificial dyes. So don't stock our hotel room with little treats made with artificial dyes, right? Because that's it. a lot of times when you have little kids, they want to like surprise them with lollipops or this or that. It's like, just tell them in advance. And that's what I've been doing. And that's been really awesome because instead they'll put like fun toys in there for them or set up a little camp or like something interesting where they're more engaged than a piece of food. That's awesome. The foundation has a 12 spoon restaurant rating project and its purpose in part is exactly what you're saying, Vani. It is to influence the chefs and the owners of the restaurants to use better ingredients. We give them a spoon. It's like the Michelin stars, depending on how kind of wise traditions friendly it, it is. Are they using broth? Are they making most of their ingredients from scratch? Are they using the ingredients in-house and so forth? And it's a beautiful thing. So I appreciate what you're doing there on a personal level. And now I want to pose to you the question that we often pose at the end here. If the listener could do one thing, just one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? Eliminate processed foods. Yeah. Eliminate processed foods. I mean, it's the key. And to start cooking, right? To start yes. cooking. Because I tell you, I had to teach myself how to cook in my early 20s. And my parents didn't want me in the kitchen. They wanted me to learn math and science. They were Indian. So they were just very like, you are going to learn this and you're going to be a student like that. They're very demanding that way. They're both teachers. So I wasn't allowed to like learn practical lifestyle skills, right? And now it's so funny. I'm teaching my kids the opposite. I'm like, no, you need to learn how to cook now because this is going to be a skill that's going to like affect your health forever. And I wish people would recognize the skill of learning how to cook and how to prepare real food is one of the best skills you'll ever have because it will not only allow you to eliminate processed foods, but also you'll realize how important it is to feed yourself good food. Mm -hmm. And it'll serve you the rest of your life. Vani, thank you for this conversation. It's been really inspiring. Well, thank you so much. Our guest today was Vani Hari. Go to foodbabe.com to learn more. And I'm Hilda Labrador, the host and producer of this podcast for the Weston A. Price Foundation. You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the transcript for this episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent review from Apple Podcasts. BQ Berry said this, You insight every time. I've learned so much from this podcast. My health has improved and so has my family's, as we've implemented changes in our lives based on the recommendations. And thank you for always asking the questions I want answered. 
You are so welcome, BQ Berry. It is my pleasure. We are here to serve you. And you too can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or simply share a link of your favorite episode to your family and friends. And thank you for listening, my friend. Stay well. And remember to keep your feet on the ground and your face to the sun. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.